Hello, and welcome to our program, More Art, Less Plastic, a conversation with innovative environmentalists around art, education, and single-use plastics. My name is Asuka Hisa, and I am the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Institute of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, otherwise known as ICALA. And we're here at the ICALA, a museum in downtown Los Angeles with our esteemed guests, Sheila Moravati and Dr. Marcus Erickson. We're brought together under the auspices of the Center for the Art of Performance at UCLA and an amazing multidimensional project by the artist Robin Frohart titled The Plastic Bag Store. Plastic Bag Store is a performance, an installation, a film, and a critique on our dependence on waste, again caused by unnecessary convenience plastics. CAP UCLA and ICLA are partnering to celebrate the work of this artist and their project. And we thought we'd take this opportunity to talk with Sheila and Marcus about their work. They're based in Los Angeles. They think globally, they act locally and nationally to make change happen with research, advocating for behavioral change and powerful actions with art and education. We're in a museum and art and culture unite all of us. But one thing we do share also is an understanding that people and art in a combination are one of the most powerful ways to communicate and connect. And both of them will be able to speak to successful uh, examples of policy change, which they have accomplished in collaboration with many. Thank you both for coming. Sheila Morvati is the founder of Crayon Collection and Habits of Waste. Crayon Collection is a nationally recognized organization that redirects gently used crayons from restaurant chains toward crayon-based art education programs in under-resourced communities. Habits of Waste advocates for a more eco-conscious society and activates collective behavioral change with effective campaigns against single-use plastics. Dr. Marcus Erickson is a writer, a veteran, and the co-founder of Five Gyres, an institute studying plastic pollution worldwide. He is also the co-founder of Leap Lab, a science center researching and forging a path toward urban resilience. His current book is Junk Raft, an ocean voyage and a rising tide toward activism to fight plastic pollution. So I wish I could hear from both of you at the same time, but we have to take turns. So Sheila, could you begin by telling us about how you came to start Crayon Collection and Habits of Waste? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you for having us. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor. Um, my work began because I was a new mom. I was going to restaurants with my three-year-old daughter who was a super picky eater and she'd go to this one place and she'd eat. So we kept going there and I kept noticing these huge habits of waste all the time. The first one was crayons being used for mere minutes and some of them not even making it out of the box yet they'd get thrown in the trash. And I'd see each table around me with the same behavior. These perfectly good crayons were just getting thrown aside while the meal was eaten. And then parents would quickly want to gather their kids up and leave. Yet these would just sort of roll onto the ground or roll to the side. And I knew there's so many children in this world who need these crayons. Why would we throw them away? Um, turns out there was 150 million crayons thrown away by restaurants alone. And companies like Crayola were, were producing 6 billion crayons a year. So I thought, there has to be a better way. So I created the Crayon Collection where we would pair up local restaurants with schools and then create projects so that kids in these lower income schools could have access to art education. And thanks to many artists, some that you've even introduced me to, we've created a wonderful art education program. It was also in those restaurants that I kept noticing tables would have five, six straws for two or three people. And I thought, I really wonder if anyone even asked for one straw and they're just kind of coming at us. And so I knew I couldn't reuse those straws, but I thought about the city of Malibu and I realized that that's a city that the world would hear about. So I spearheaded the first plastic straw and cutlery ban in history and was able to really see the ripple effect of that one moment that um, you know, Malibu was willing to take a jump and lean, lean into. So that was how I started Habits of Waste. And 
because everyone said, are you doing crayons or straws? And so I realized, you know, it's all a habit of waste. And that was the beginning of my journey. Dr. Marcus Erickson, could you tell us about what you do? Um, I'm, I'm still floored by six billion crayons a year <laughs> that get made. That's a lot of waste. That's one product. Um, and that's, that, that's emblematic of so the whole waste issue in, in our, our culture, our country, our culture, and globally, mm -hmm. this, uh, this idea of you make something and then use it for a very short period of time, and where it goes is an afterthought. But now with eight billion people, and I've watched population double in my lifetime, four billion, cl close to eight billion now, there's no room for waste. There's no room for trash. Um, so, but my background, the way I began in this issue, I think I could go back to you know, as, as a kid being uh, 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 immersed in nature. I grew up in Louisiana, just outside New Orleans. I'd walk to the swamp and catch snakes and turtles. So a deep love for, for nature. Um, when I finished high school, I joined the Marine Corps. I was in the Marines for six years, ended up in the first Gulf War. If you remember images of burning oil wells, I was one of the Marines on the ground. And I remember sitting in a hole in the sand among oil wells, really questioning why we're here. Why we're here to, to, to rescue the richest country on the planet, Kuwait. Um, and I understood the human rights violations. There are other, other things going on around the world, but we were there, this addiction to fossil fuels, which is the root of the, the chemistry and the energy, what makes those six billion crayons. So I had this, this, this sort of epiphany, my, my mind was pivoting. And then I, I met my wife, Anna Cummins, uh, years later. Um, and we, we, had, we both knew about the plastics in, 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 the, in the oceans. We had heard that story. Um, I forgot to tell you, when I was in the Gulf War, in that, that hole in the sand, I remember making a promise to myself that if I survived the war, I would raft the Mississippi River. And I did so. And I saw the unending trail of trash going down the river. And I met Anna soon after. And at that point, you know, I had, I had been to war, so I saw the source of the chemistry to make plastics. I'd been down, down the Mississippi River, spent five months camping on the river, seeing endless trails of trash. So I knew where that trash was going. I saw both ends. And I'd been to Midway Atoll in the same time, a little island in the mid-Pacific where I saw albatross full of plastics in their stomachs. Had all these experiences and it made me realize, okay, this, this consumer culture, this consumption, we're going to drown in plastics. And that was almost, I'd say 15 years ago, my career pivoted to focus on that. And at that time, there were a bunch of unanswered questions about these ocean fictitious garbage patches. That made the headlines 10 20, 10, 20 years ago. So the unanswered questions were, well, where is it? How much is there? And what's ecological impact? So we began our organization, the Five Gyres Institute, to do the science to answer those questions. They were all operating on common facts. And that was the beginning of our organization. Tell me in your work, what has worked for you and who and what keep you going? Because we need you to keep going and you, and you need to keep your leaders creating more leaders. I can jump in on this. I have to say there's something that, you know, we've been talking about a couple times here that we are assuming that we are making a choice when we're doing something to, you know, waste. And many times I don't believe it's a choice. I believe that the systems are in place where there really isn't a choice for a better option. And so that is my mission, is to create opportunities so that us as human beings can do better, can have an option to you know, even know how to navigate all the stuff that's coming at us that is single use and to be thrown away. And so I, I have faith in humanity. I don't believe that we are here on this planet to destroy it. I believe that the, 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 the systems are kind of coming at us in so many which ways that it's hard to kind of get out of it and, and see it anymore. And so I'm trying to peel back to kind of simpler times, showing everyone that it's, it, it is an option to go without some of this stuff. And so that's my, my main work and that's what keeps me going for sure. And I, I love what, what you're doing because it gives people a path because they learn about a problem and they realize, okay, now what? What do I do? And you got to give them that. So what you're doing is exactly what the issue needs. Thank you. Um, but, but the issue, I think, to understand what the problem is and what, what gives me strength is, is the people that I, I, get, to, I get to meet and, and work with. And for our organization, 
is take them with us to the middle of nowhere to see what the problem is. And I brought one sample I want to share with you today. This is a sample we collected probably 10 years ago in the middle of the North Pacific Ocean. And this is halfway between Los Angeles and Hawaii. It's as far, almost as far from land as you can get on the planet. And you skim the ocean surface, we'll drag our nets, and it's just the surface. It's a fine, fine mesh net, smaller holes than the holes in your t-shirt. So you're picking up lots of plankton. The fish escape because you're going so slow with this net. And you get a lot of plastic. What you see here is a kaleidoscope of, of all these small particles. Now pass around as you can see. You can check out the little bits and pieces. What's interesting, the red and orange and yellow pieces are gone. We think fish are selecting those. And this comes from one of 20 expeditions we've run in the last 10, last 10 years, taking people out to sea. I'd say at least four to 500 people have spent weeks on boats with us, crossing from Brazil to Cape Town, or from Chile to Easter Island, up to Hawaii, to Japan, back to Hawaii, uh, crossing the North Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, to Mauritius from Perth, Australia, really crossing vast expanse of ocean and realizing that you can go to the most remote parts of the planet and still see our trash. And when people see that, and you have that, that aha moment with people, with, uh, with people that may or may not have known about the issue, that may not care or know much about it, when they see that, they really get it. And like you said, to be an optimist, I believe people have this basic goodness. They want to do the right thing. They learn about the problem, and, and, and what Sheila does, she shows them, here's the path to do something better. And what you guys did is showing what away is. This is what away is, ladies and gentlemen. When you throw something <laughs> away, this is it. And that, thank you for doing that because this is so helpful to see when people talk about microplastics. What's a microplastic? Well, this is all microplastics, wouldn't you say? Exactly. It's exactly what it is. So this is what we're eating. This is what the fish eat. It goes into our bodies in the end. And sometimes it is, you know, necessary to show people these type of things um, and see it because otherwise no one understands how small it is. Like there was somebody saying that we're, we're eating a credit card size amount of plastic every week. And it's hard to imagine or believe that that's even possible for us but there you have it, it's all in there. That's very obvious now that that's possible to do. My, my role at the museum is education and I, education is so critical in, in all of this. So when you're taking people on expeditions or when you're creating a curriculum around crayons, that's got to be the most, one of the most powerful ways to, to teach others so that it's transmitted and that our next generation can live from our generation's uh, mistakes. So. And, and as you know, Oscar, not everyone learns in the same way. I discovered that, I mean, as, uh, as the scientist in our organization, I publish research papers, and even the abstract of a research paper can be very dense, and most folks will just gloss over it. Mm -hmm. So you've got to bring a whole communication strategy. So a scientist need to work with artists, need to work with performers, uh, with, with videographers, with storytellers, and with politicians and people that are good at social media. You, all these things I've discovered, multiple stakeholders, whether they're, they're industry, they're, they're, they're teachers, they're students, they're, they're activists like, like we are, or they work, work in the private sector, or they're, they're a politician, they all see the world differently. So understanding different ways to communicate to them is, is essential to to building a base of support for whatever kind of policy you're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Seeing and, and doing is very important, learning by doing. Um, but I also wanna talk about what you mentioned in our early discussions in preparation for this about the systems changes. So uh, you mentioned, Sheila, that Malibu, you're, you're in Malibu, you're in the West Side, beach cleanups are a big thing, but what can we do beyond the beach cleanup? Yeah, our goal is to not have the trash be on the beach, to have a beach cleanup. That's like the <laughs> dream, right? Um, for us, one of the things that happened after the Malibu plastic straw and cutlery ban where people kept saying, but I'm ordering food and I keep getting plastic cutlery and I didn't even ask for it and I can't communicate with them. And so 
Um, I created an email campaign called Cutout Cutlery, where we were sending emails to all the major food delivery applications, so Uber Eats, Postmates, DoorDash, and Grubhub, asking them to change the default setting so that users don't receive plastic cutlery unless they request it. So just the behavior change from opting in for something versus opting out is a drastic difference. And so being, um, you know, as persistent as we are, we sent about 14,000 emails and we were lucky enough to get all four food delivery applications on board. And Postmates um, gave us a really crazy number. After one year of participating in cutout cutlery, they saved over 122 million packs of plastic cutlery saving restaurants also $3.2 million. So we took that nugget and we worked with the coalition that we're actually both a part of um, and started to push this out nationally to create legislation for all plastic cutlery to always be provided upon request only. Luckily, the city of LA joined in recently and now we're working on the state of California. Washington DC joined in. So you're gonna hear about it more and more because it kind of went out to all the, um, you know, plastic pollution fighters out there and they're all trying really hard to get this. But like I said, that's a systems change so that it's not, the onus is not on us to always be trying to navigate because I'm thinking about that mom and dad who's just trying to get dinner on the table. They're rushing. They're not like knee deep in this work like us. We have to think about their priorities as like they're just trying to make it through the day and they're not thinking about plastic. They're just thinking about dinner. So let's create an opportunity so there's just one less hurdle to cross to do better. I brought something I want to show you about the systems that were in the past that changed. And now we're trying to change them back. Mm -hmm. So I brought a copy of, of Life magazine from 1955. And there's an image in here, an article with an image. The image is, has been seen in most plastic pollution talks I see, they'll, rep, they'll reference this image of a family, you know, throwing trash in the air. And the title is called Throw Away Living. This is 1955, post-World War II, when the idea of throwing things away became popularized because all the, the industry that, it, that, was, uh, uh, that was up and running during, the, during World War II, the war effort, now is shifting to uh, domestic production. So every family wanted a washing machine, a hula hoop, Tupperware, a two car garage, you wanted all these things. And, but what companies realized was that if you make something durable that lasts a long time, you only get a customer once. So the idea of planned obsolescence came into play as well. Make things so they break in time. And that's a term, planned obsolescence, mm -hmm. that, as you all know, that uh, took the world by storm. Um, but that wasn't the way it was in the old system prior to World War II. Um, if, if, we have, if any of you have grandparents who lived during the Depression, they still today don't throw things away. Like my grandmother, she used to save her plastic bags and rinse them out and wash them, Ziplocs as well. They had this idea of, of, of conservation of materials. Now throwing something away made no sense. And um, from also during the war itself, there were uh, victory gardens and recycle your metals. So there's a conservation of materials. We had to unlearn that. We had to learn to throw things away. It wasn't part of our culture. The system shifted through very effective marketing advertising. But now the, the results of that is just uh, mountains of trash, landfills filling fast. And I wanna read the first sentence here because it's quite obnoxious. A sign of the times, but it says, throw away living, disposable items, cut down household chores. The objects flying through the air in this picture would take 40 hours to clean except that no housewife need bother. They're all meant to be thrown away. Throwing things away, that was, that was the system's change. So now trying to come back to, to that conservation of materials, realizing, like you said, that there is no away. Six billion crayons can't go in the trash each year. Over a decade, that'll be its own landfill of just crayons. So I think changing the system back to um, um, a, a circular economy, a zero waste circular economy where materials stay close. And the conversation you're seeing now, it's more about local circular economies, globalizing ideas, but not stuff. Keeping things close within, within a circular loop locally. Like I've seen companies, one company has a stainless steel cup and they've, they've got all the restaurants and coffee shops to honor the same cup. You drink a beverage, it's dirty, you bring it over here. You get a new beverage, the cup is dirty, you bring it over there and they'll wash it and give it to you. The same cup stays in circulation. 
So we're seeing those kinds of zero waste systemic changes happening. And the business models, there, there are so many out there now. So I feel optimistic as well as I see people want to do the right thing and finding very creative, novel ways to do it. So let's close with sort of some of your recommendations for um, remembering that we can do this. I would say for me, um, I always think of the story of how the plastic water bottle came to be. So you have the New York City Fashion Week, you've got Naomi Campbell and all the most beautiful fashion models carrying an enormous plastic water bottle, a very fancy brand name, and I'm not going to advertise them here. <laughs> but they're walking down the catwalk and people are looking and saying, what is this? Is this like water in a plastic bottle? And it's almost like you're on Mars thinking, why would anybody do that? And people are questioning this idea that you're going to buy plastic bottles with water in it and it's water's free, but why? So my thought here is, you know, there is a lot of marketing prowess in these huge companies that is geared specifically towards changing our mindsets. But we have, we have to think about, you know, what makes sense to us and trust that. And when it seems odd to pay for plastic water bottles when your water is free, trust that instinct and don't allow these marketing campaigns to kind of infiltrate your own uh, reasoning. And so, I, I, again, I believe like just in, instinctually, what makes sense to you? Does this seem right to just consistently buy and throw away and buy and throw away? I think if people would just give them a sec themselves a moment to just think about what it is that feels right. Again, when I brought up crayon collection to people and, and saying, do you realize your kids are watching this and you're teaching them to be a part of the throwaway society? Like, do you realize a crayon is useful to some, some other child? And of course, what else do they, what do they do with these crayons? Well, they're throwing them in the garbage. So it's like people don't even see it. So I just want people to just take a moment, take back those curtains and see and think about what makes sense and what doesn't and use that you know, inner guidance that we all have. We're human beings on this planet. We, we belong here as a part of it. And we understand much more than these marketers give us credit for. I think I would say um, science, art, activism, and, uh, and uh, constant pressure over time. Mm -hmm. I think that leads to change. That's, that's, that's the, the change I've witnessed in my 15, 20 years working on this issue. For example, when we went to the Great Lakes the expedition, we found little small little plastic beads on the lake surface. Turns out they were micro beads from facial scrubs. We had a smoking gun. We actually brought this to Procter & Gamble and said, hey, look, we've got, we've got the, the same size, same chemistry, and the exact match to your product. And it took us a little time to get, we got Tulane Law School in New Orleans to create a sample legislation and a quarterly journal published what, what a federal bill might look like. We had activists across the country sharing photographs, sharing, uh, sharing videos. And we got two senators to push that bill and former President Obama signed the Micro Bead Free Waters Act. Constant pressure through art, science and activism. And then just recently, uh, we published a paper on plastic bags and camels. I went back to Kuwait, back to uh, Qatar and Oman, that region of the world to study plastics in the Gulf of Arabia. And I met a veterinarian. He said, you want to see plastics? Come with me. Went in the desert and we found half a dozen camel skeletons Inside the rib cage of just bones, I pulled out a mass of plastic bags, maybe 2,000 bags, as big as a suitcase, in this animal's chest. And he described the suffering and almost brought me to tears. And when I convey that to people and I show that object at conferences and show it to people, they get it. And it's, it's visual. I've had artists, uh, Chris Jordan made a beautiful visual of this thing on a turntable. I published the research paper. We have so many bag, uh, bag bands happening around the world. And this adds to that constant pressure over time and change happens. I agree with him. Yes. Art, <laughs> activism. Yes. And pressure. And pressure. And I tell everybody, go to your city education. council meetings, like speak up. They, you have three minutes. Everyone does. Two to three minutes. Use it. Go and speak up about something that means something to you. Someone might not know something that you're seeing that's wrong and, and use that time. Get out there, you know, just do what you can. You'd be really surprised to see how far you can go. I'm thinking that during the pandemic, especially the beginning of the pandemic, when we were forced to quarantine and stay at home, 
something incredible happened to our environment. We, we started to see environmental healing and what that could look like. Suddenly, we all were inside, but if you managed to look outside, you saw clearer skies. If the news was reporting pollution levels plummeting, uh, animals were roaming the streets. We were feeling cleaner air, and that gave us so much hope. At least I was euphoric because when you were in the time of mass consumption and waste and you just thought, oh, we're never going to get out of this, you saw that it could be possible in such a short time. So if there was a silver lining to the pandemic, that could be it, even though it's still very, very difficult around the world. But now we're reemerging in the city of Los Angeles. We're about to reopen fully and you both endured some traffic coming to this talk and I'm fearing that we're gonna forget. And so why would that happen? What is the disconnect? And how can we see these clear skies again? The systems of the past and the systems anew, like what is the systems change we need so we can be a, a resilient civilization with a, a population that saturates the planet? If we reach 10 billion people by 2050, what systems need to be in place? We can't be using single-use plastics. There'll be no place to put them. We'll be up to our ears in trash. But you know, the older generation, post-World War II, was really steeped in the idea of convenience and consumption. Um, and now the newer generation is seeing, like you just mentioned, the possibilities. If we stop consuming, stop hopping in our gas-guzzling cars, what does the world look like? What does the biosphere look like? Does it come back close to us? Do the, do the skies clear so you, uh, so you can see the, the birds above? And I think the young generation wants that, they see it. And I think going forward, the, the theme is gonna be change, change, systems change. So the disconnect, I think the younger, uh, the younger generation is maybe gonna go on without the older generation. But if they wanna come along, I think the word for them is legacy. What do you want your life, the meaning of your life to be? Is it, is it the weight of trash you consumed in your, in your lifetime? Or is it what you give to the resilience of the next generation? So I think that's the word. Change for the younger folks and, and legacy for, for the older folks. Yeah, I would just add that you know, the pandemic gave us a glimpse that, of what this world could be like. And having that moment was such a, a, a gift among so much, you know, sadness and trying times. And just that glimmer, I think, was enough to give us all renewed hope that we haven't lost this battle yet. You know, we, we do have a lot of power and control, older generation, younger generation, all of it. And I do think the best thing would be for the younger generation to have those conversations with the older generations and really share in a loving and meaningful way. Because I know I've had those conversations with my mom about plastics and things like that. And you know, she's starting to understand now that it's really impacting the planet. And when we, we had that break, um, staying home and being safer at home, it, it was proof that we are actually able to reverse this. So um, I think talking, discussing conversations um, with no shame. I really am a believer that don't shame anyone into trying to do something. That's not going to work. So go in with, you know, open arms, loving heart, all of that. You know, once again, I believe in humanity that we are here and our nature is to protect this place. So let's go back to that. And when you've done policy change or you've made legislation passed, there are, there are systems that, that we can participate in with the government in, in place to be able to speak up. To help, yeah. And absolutely. you have children who, who can speak up because they've had this experience with crayon collection. Yeah, my, my daughter was nine years old. I brought her to Malibu, she spoke. She used her three minutes and she spoke there. She was the youngest person to ever speak in city council. So never too early, get them started young. It's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And you need the, 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 the young activists, you need the activists, the artists, the scientists, all working together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, mean, I mentioned earlier, the, the constant change over time it doesn't happen overnight. So you, you have a, a, a nine-year-old speak at city council, and I've watched every council member, they, they stop, they listen they when listen. a child speaks. <laughs> they do not interrupt or dismiss a child. That's true. That's, that, that, that will end their career in politics. It's being visual, 
being very heady in science, in science publications, the art, the science, the activism, getting young people in front of city councils, and the constant pressure over time never let up. And that's how systems change happens. Absolutely, we've got to all work together. Thank you so much. Thank you to CAP UCLA, Robin Frohart for the extraordinary pro project called the Plastic Bag Store, which you will see soon. Thank you again.